goblins. Psst. Hey, okay, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. Shh. I think there has been no major drama for an entire week of fantasy news. I know, I know, it, I, it's exciting, it's exciting. So let's just get the fantasy news flowing, start it on off, and of course, without any further ado, Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host and today, oh, we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with some beautiful cover reveals for the genre because we have a cover reveal from Nadia Okorafor for She Who Knows, Fire Spitter, which will be available August 24th, had its cover reveal with an illustration from the amazing Greg Ruth. And I love that the temperature of the room was taken and in the tweet, it's the specifically says, no AI ever needed. Greg, is the quote real thing? I absolutely love the art on this cover. I think it looks sensational. And on an aesthetics level, I do like the font choice, but as a dyslexic, these really stylized fonts you see every now and then just make my brain basically shut down. I have to sit there and read it like a goddamn fifth grader and go, that's an H for sure. She who knows? All right. <laughs> I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. And for my Acora 4 fans out there, you can read chapter one at a link provided in the tweet. Check it all now. And we had another cover reveal with more simple yet still fancy schmancy font, and that would be for the Strange and Sundry Magics, a Wayward Heroes Adventure by Cal Black, with cover art by Madeline Nooney Barker. Quick note, Having a cover with an adorable ghost dog that yes, is wearing a skull, deal with it with like an adventurer's assortment of things behind it, very immediately appealing. I'm getting like legends and lattes, but maybe more adventure bent uh, tone from this cover. And that's a cover doing its job. Well done, Madeline. Now, would you believe me if I said that Ryan Reynolds is involved in this next piece of book news? It's about like three degrees of separation, but still we'll get there. And that is because an adaptation has been announced to be in the works for John Scalzi's starter villain, which is fairly high up on my TV. Right now I'm reading Fire and Song. After that's gonna be uh, rereading uh, Dandelion Dynasty. Then I'm gonna get to Actor. And then I think after that, or maybe in between some of the Grace of Kings books, or sorry, Dandelion Dynasty books, we'll, we'll squeeze in starter villain, or maybe between the Actar books. But I also really, really want to get to the new Murder Bot book, which I somehow, my life is nothing but trying to figure out what order I will read books in. But the reason Ryan Reynolds is related to this is he owns the company that has purchased the rights to adapt Starter Villain, Maximum Effort Productions. And they are looking to adapt this with Jesse Andrews, whose previous credits include Pixar's Luca, incredible movie, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. I don't know what that is, but now I'm kind of curious. Why is she dying? Is she sick? Get her help. To pin the script. For those of you who aren't aware of the base premise of this story, it reads according to Goodreads. Inheriting your uncle's supervillain business is more complicated than you might think, particularly when you discover who's running the place. Ooh, I'm not gonna read anymore because that's all the time we have. But if you are a John Scalzi fan or want to possibly be one, be sure to get excited for the upcoming starter villain adaptation. Right now, start. You don't look more excited. Come on, this is cool. Look at the cat. Are you not excited for the cat? Hey, look, a cat who's wearing boots. That's crazy. Wow. And in some news of just an author being a cool dudes, we had Andy Weir for the 10th anniversary of The Martian's release, just releasing for free, no strings attached whatsoever, some additional The Martian writing. It's not a whole lot, but it's just available for fans, which is so cool. I like when I see an author just be like, hey, Love you, you've given me an amazing career, and for that, I'm not gonna charge you nothing. I'm just gonna start feeding you. Here, do you like my feeding? Let Andy Weir feed you. Jesus, what was that? I actually just wanted to say, Andy Weir, if you ever wanna come on the channel to talk about books, I'd love to have you. <laughs> oh, but before we keep going here in today's episode of Fantasy News, I wanna bring you a quick word from today's sponsor, my publisher, Wraithmarked Creative. Uh, did you know that a demon is awakening? Because the Demon Awakens book one is getting the full Wraithmarked Creative treat. R.A. Salvatore, you might have heard of him. He's a best-selling author who has sold over 35 million books, a little bit more than myself. Like all Wraithmark creation, the base book has been designed with top quality in mind, featuring high-end offset printing, Smithsone binding, and an attached ribbon bookmark, and gold gilding of the page edges. For, you know, a little bit more of that 
aesthetic. Additionally, it has an embossed dust jacket with metallic foiling featuring custom art from the incredible Wayne Reynolds and cloth bound case. That way you can just sit there and rub it. You know you wanna. The inside is even better. Every book is hand signed by R.A. Salvatore with a custom interior design, embellished chapter headings, and custom signed tippins, all done by STK Creations. Oh, and what's that name? Felix Ortiz. He will be doing 10 interior illustrations for this latest entry from R.A. Salvatore. Plus, that's the uh, plus a full color map on the inside, designed by Augustinus Reginis. Excuse me. Don't, you know what? Let's just keep that pronunciation and just be aware that's the channel branding here. And if that wasn't even enough motivation for you R.A. Salvatore fans out there, there are of course additional stretch goals to be unlocked. So go ahead and check out the link in the description down below if you would like to get your little claws on this R.A. Salvatore special edition. And the big news here for Percy Jackson is it has been renewed for season two over on Disney Plus. And as someone who kind of just casually watched the first season, it was pretty darn good. It didn't hit me as great. It didn't hit me as bad. It was just like that it was just a solid adaptation of a popular YA series. Cool. I think it's like healthy for society. Every now and then we just get stuff that's like, that was fine. It's not anger worthy. It's not exceptional. It's not changing the game. It just kind of took a story we all really enjoyed as kids and brought it to life. And now we can share it with a whole new generation for a first time. How cool is that? Uh, so yeah, I'm actually pretty excited for season two, though getting into the sad news, yes, Lance Riddick passed away and they're gonna need to recast his Zeus. Though I'm not sure if the next season requires the character of Zeus to show up from what I remember. And those are some massive shoes to fill. So I'm excited to see who they cast next, but rest in peace to an absolute legend. And in a last minute fantasy news correction, you may have seen reports that the Akatar adaptation over at Hulu is canceled, but that is not true. Variety is now correcting the original ports, and while it has been long delayed, it is not officially dead. Yet. Now are you ready to be annoyed? Because Coyote vs. Acme is, yes, just going to be shelved by Warner Brothers and not brought to the screen. Despite it being promised to be shopped around, apparently last month, one of the producers involved, Chris Dilefire, received a call essentially stating that Warner Brothers wants to close the books on this and put it behind them. They are looking to make reportedly between 35 to $40 million in tax write-offs by shelving this project. And we're asking between 75 to 80 million to the streaming services it was being offered to, including Netflix Prime. Though notably, they never had to release how big of offers they managed to receive from these streaming services. It was, again, allegedly from what we're hearing, a kind of take it or leave it deal from Warner Brothers. So this film is reportedly, as of now, just going to be shelved and deleted forever. We've seen some like meme kind of attempts to actually get this out there. Like Adam from Your Movie Sucks saying like Mr. Beast should buy it. I know he's just kind of joking there, but some people seem to kind of like take it seriously. I want to make it clear. Mr. Beast certainly has f you money. He does not have purchase a film for $80 million level f you money. <laughs> and there's no new observation to be made here. This has happened to previous projects before like Batgirl. And being perfectly honest, I believe it'll happen to many more in the future. There's no real hot information, saying that Hollywood is not exactly artistically motivated, but instead is entirely money motivated in 2024 is about three decades too late, but it still undeniably sucks and stings. And while I'm not going to pretend like I'm the biggest Looney Tunes fan ever, it's a franchise, something I certainly love from my childhood. And this movie could have been fine. It could have been good. It could have been great. We will never know the artistic intention put into this. The people who did wake up and animate and act and put together even just the craft service table what have you really actually tried to give something to fans. We'll never know if we like their efforts because for just a tax write-off, whatever artistic value there was to be had, discussion, moment of dad watching with child in front of TB bonding, uh, we'll never be allowed to see the light of day. And there's no like happy end to this. It's just like, next news, meep. 
I guess. Now we did get some Game of Thrones news and I, I wanna make it clear that this is unrelated to that other spinoff we heard about that was related to the actual House of Dragon time, but, and that, but it, it is is related every week. There's like, there's gonna be the Jon Snow show, but actually there's not, but maybe they're gonna do a show about Aegon's conquest. That could be canceled too. We have House of the Dragon already, but there's possibly gonna be another show that follows Sansa Stark as she Sansa's the son. And then we're gonna go to the White Walker sitcom, and then maybe we'll do another thing. Has George R. R. Martin put out the next book yet? I don't know, but we should do like nine more Game of Thrones shows. What if we did a fucking show about Ned Stark's beard? Can we do a show about Ned Stark's beard? Is the nipple bleeding yet? That's still liquid. Keep milking. Keep milking. Oh, I'd watch some of these spinoffs. I'm not saying I'm not gonna watch some of them. I'm interested. It's the confusion around the constant, like we're doing this, but we're not actually gonna do it. We're gonna make, this show's been greenlit, but we canceled it. This one's actually been made and we're gonna air it, but this another one that we're gonna announce is a maybe. Are you guys gonna like it? And also, yeah, we did just get some photos of a potential Game of Thrones project that's been gone for five years. And they're like, look, this is a thing that almost happened because what happened? Like, I do think Game of Thrones still has potential. I'm not mad that we're getting these things. I will watch them. It's just from a marketing angle, it's a cluster in some rather cool news, Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan are teaming up for a vampire period piece set in the 1930s New Orleans, where apparently Michael B. Jordan will be playing twins no idea if like one of them's a vampire, both of them's a vampire. Well, I, I don't know exactly what the setup here is gonna be, but I deeply love Michael B. Jordan. I really enjoy Ryan Coogler. And anytime there's these like actor, director, muse things going on, like the famous all like important one that everyone talks about is like Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. I like it that these two have a career uh, where like the, they've been working to each other quite a bit and they seem to creatively have really good chemistry. So the idea of seeing them come together for a fantasy vampire film, yeah. Speaking of just yeah. Is cursing bad? No. We are getting a new Predator standalone movie from the same creative team that brought us the recent kind of reboot to the Predator franchise. Uh, and that one was surprisingly better than I thought it'd be. Not great, but fun. And this new Predator movie, Badlands, directed by Dan Tretchenberg, is apparently gonna be taking a lot of the lessons learned from Prey and trying to, you know, evolve on the concept. And while I liked Prey, I think that approach to a Predator movie, a very simple, like, person v Predator, that's kind of what made the first one so great. Uh, is the right direction for this franchise. I don't like it when it's brought into the city or it's like teams of people. Shane Black, what the hell happened there? You are one ugly mother. And so I can't believe I'm saying this in 2024. In the day and age of franchise overflowing, I'm happy to see Predator still going and rebooting and refreshing in a way that's kind of giving me hope. Like I, I feel like more franchises, if they took this, let's get back to real basics and find what made this work in the first place. If they had that approach, we'd have a far better track record of reboots <laughs> in the post 2020 uh, floods. And in some shocking news, I am shocked I say. Apparently uh, Microsoft is being accused of going back on its work when it comes to the recent announced job cuts for Activision. In January, 1,900 job cuts were announced for Activision three months after the $69 billion purchase was complete. And the FTC has said that this contradicts Microsoft's previous statements on the matter. Microsoft responds to this, of course, with some corporate jargon saying, Consistent with broader trends in the gaming industry, Activision was already planning on eliminating a significant number of jobs while still operating as an independent company. Hey, Microsoft. Can you give us specifically how many they were planning? And was it anywhere close to 1900? I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying like, prove it. Will you please tell me that? The recent announcement thus cannot be attributed fully to the merger. Fully doing a lot of, a lot of lift in there, isn't it? Not gonna lie, my favorite part of this article and maybe 15% of the reason I am covering it is just the sentence. The controversial merger gives Microsoft control of popular games such as Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, and Candy Crush. Candy Crush do be crushing it, still, I guess. 
For those of you who haven't kept up with this whole story, Microsoft did originally uh, get blocked from buying Activision, but after they made some concessions, that was then reversed. And this is unfortunately, once again, touching on a larger situation going on in terms of gaming industry uh, drama. I'm just trying to take the bits that are most directly related to the fantasy news here and let you know what's going on. I am of the personal opinion that, yeah, Microsoft's probably going back on their word here, but they'll have a really good way of justifying it. And I just, the big takeaway at the end of this is, wow, that's for 1,900 people. I hope they're able to find employment. But I will have linked down below more thorough coverage of all of the recent shakeups that have been going on in the gaming industry. Now, I am well aware that during a recent display of a superb owl, there was a bunch, a plethora, you could say, of trailers dropped, and people tend to want to know my thoughts on these. I will do a review of each one in detail now. Big boy out of the way first, Deadpool 3. I initially thought, like, come on, the Deadpool gimmick is kind of of just overplayed at this point, and I don't know if this level of meta humor can still land in 2024. But despite my kind of groaning at the first meta joke in the trailer, the fact that it's gonna be like going through and related to the MCU, I could be tempted into going to see that as kind of like a send off goodbye to me ever watching an MCU film again, because I'm so checked out of there. Um, and yeah, there's definitely a part of me that's like Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine. Logan was the perfect send off, but if I don't consider this like a new entry for the character and just look at it as Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman having fun, yeah, I'll probably end up seeing this in theaters. That's that's actually, you know what? I will admit this trailer did a really good job. It actually managed to get me excited for a superhero movie. Eight out of 10 trailer. Now for Wicked, Kayla and I saw the stage play of this and it was a great time. I highly recommend you check out the local theaters around you are playing this. It is up there with seeing Les Mis live for me, granted because it was just such a spectacular performance. Like both of them were just top notch traveling shows. Uh, the trailer, I have no experience with Ariana Grande as an actress. I do not have, I'm not saying she's bad. I'm not, I wanna make that clear. I just have only ever known her as a pop star, though I know she got her start on like Disney stuff. For me, I'm more iffy on this. I, I think it was so well designed structurally and everything to be a stage performance that this could be entering into a case of mismediuming a story, but I'd like to be proven wrong because I'd really like there to be an at-home version of this story for me to enjoy. We had Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes after that. Now, I have probably the strangest relationship of any franchise we're talking about here when it comes to the Planet of the Apes franchise because I have seen all of these movies. I don't know why. I have no like commitment to them. It's partially just due to Andy Serkis being involved with all these projects. Projects. But uh, this one, like again, I'm like, I don't really feel the need to go see that. Why am I gonna go see that? I'm gonna go see it still. And I think partially because it, it, it's well aware that it's schlocky, like they're still doing the fur bikinis thing, just looking at this trailer and they have like a woman, despite it apparently being like caveman times again, who's like perfectly plucked eyebrows. Cause even in 2024, hey, hey, hey if you have a female protagonist, she better be fine looking. <laughs> it could be the apocalypse, but if oh, if they have a small mustache going on, that is a deal breaker for ticket sales. <laughs> so I don't know. I I'm gonna go see it because like I enjoy schlock, and this is like the highest budget, most wellingest doneinest schlock franchise out there, uh, and I dig it. And then of course we had Despicable Me's four, and I I am ashamed to say I laughed out loud at this trailer. I shouldn't have but it, I'm not gonna see it. I'm not gonna see it, but I did laugh. So for Deadpool, we're going eight out of 10. For Wicked, we're going five, because I just I really don't know how to feel. Planet of the Apes, I'll give it a six. Like, I'm not gonna say it's like game-changing cinema, but like, it's always well shot. And like, it's it's intense. Like, oh my gosh, monkey army's clashing. This is insane. And Despicable Me, it's a begrudging four. And today's self-pub promo from the Goblin Horde is Seeds of War by Shuao F. Silva pitched as a book for fans who like the grittiness of Joe Abercrombie with the hard magic systems of Brandon Sanderson and Brian McClellan. The Smokesmiths is a gritty epic fantasy series with a harsh world of smoke magic, alien creatures, and ancient secrets where characters do their best to come out on top. He ran like the monster he was, and the smoke followed. Gilmore is a single mother and war veteran turned crime boss set on protecting her family and her town. Oberasis is a petty thief, pretending to be God to protect a terrible secret. Rednow is the world's most feared mercenary, but his best days are behind him and there's one job left to do. In a world of dangerous monsters and devastating smoke magic, the seeds of war are being planted. Allies must be treasured and enemies defeated. Check it out in the link down below. 
But this has been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already. And if you would like to support what I do here, you can go to Backer Kit and go ahead and get yourself a pre-ordered, super special signed hardback edition of Neon Ghosts. If you're awaiting it for me, just regularly listed on Wraithmark's website, though, it will soon be. And I also have exciting news coming down the road. Sorry for that pump. Uh, about the audiobook and ebook. So stay tuned. I'm actually like, this is the best thing I've ever written. And I'm really excited for the early feedback I've gotten from the people who have gone out of their way to buy the ebook and audiobooks. The people who have done that, thank you. Um, and I'm currently in the middle of writing my next book, which is going to be a third series that I'm going to start before I go back to my first and second series. I, I'm young. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to finish all my series. Just be patient. And uh, no, I can't write as fast as every other author because I have to do this job first. But anyway, that's all. The, bye.